Hello investigators and welcome to Until the End of Time. My name is Ronika. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we are talking about Kaimani Jones, the security consultant. There will also be two new preview cards in this video. Everything new preview cards and more is also going to be in the next recap video. So don't worry if you're not interested in learning about Kaimani Jones right now, you can just watch the next video. But I wanted to talk about these cards because they seem relevant for Kaimani Jones. Let's start with the investigator cards. I've already talked about Kamani twice now, but as I mentioned in the last video, their deck building and signature cards, cards were revealed at Gen Con, so we can discuss them fully now. I've also had a few chances to play Kamani already, both true solo and two-handed solo, so I've gotten a chance to test a couple of these cards already, and I have some thoughts about how you want to build Kamani. Let's do a quick refresher about the Investigator in case you missed them. They are the Rogue from the Scarlet Keys. They have 3 Willpower, 2 Intellect, 2 Combat, 5 Agility, a free triggered ability to engage an exhausted enemy at your location. Keep in mind it has to be an exhausted enemy. And then a Reaction ability. When you attempt to evade an exhausted non-lead enemy, you can add your Intellect to your skill value for this attempt. If you succeed by at least X, discard that enemy. X is that enemy's remaining health. And an Elder Sign effect, plus one, if there's an exhausted enemy at your location, you automatically succeed instead. Eight health, six sanity. Their deck building, uh, they have a deck size of 30. Deck building options, rogue card, zero to five, tool cards, zero to four, and neutral cards, zero to five. Their signature cards are the grappling hook, agent Fletcher, and one random basic weakness and they start the campaign with five additional experience. They have two signature cards, as already mentioned. The Grappling Hook is a three cost asset with an intellect, agility, and wild icon. It is item and tool traded, takes up one hand slot, and is Kaimani Jones deck only. Actions performed using Grappling Hook do not provoke attacks of opportunity, and there is a double action ability to exhaust the Grappling Hook, take up to three different basic actions from the following list, in any order, engage, evade, investigate, or move. If you investigate, you use your agility instead of your intellect. And Agent Fletcher is a weakness enemy, humanoid coterie and detective traded. Uh, alert, hunter, prey, Kamani Jones only. While Kamani Jones is evading, Agent Fletcher reduce their intellect value to zero. Uh, two health, or sorry, two fight, three health, three evade, one damage, one horror and looking absolutely dashing with that red tie, which I'm sure denotes their coder status. All right, so that's the basics of Kamani, but how do we actually build a deck for them? There are a lot of different cards that I think have a chance to work in Kamani, and there are a lot of strategies that you could employ with them. Because of this, I've decided to try and distill this down to four decks that I think would work well with Kamani, and please do not take this as an exhaustive list or the only possible Kamani decks. This is meant to add, act as a, as a hype video, as a ID video, as a couple of suggestions and inspiration, but not as the only ways that you can play Kaimani. However, for each of these video or for each of these decks, what I want them to be is to be functional, to be easy to understand and talk about, and to kind of talk about which cards really work and why you would want to be interested in this archetype. And I've split them down into dealing with clues, dealing with enemies, and dealing with the random mythos tests or other challenges that we have to overcome. These four decks are going to be an agility-based deck, an intellect-based deck, a Chuck Fergus event-based deck, and then a pure enemy manager deck. Now, for the pure enemy manager deck, the answer to how do we deal with clues is we don't. This is a deck that's designed with the idea that somebody else in the group, possibly multiple other people, are already stacked to the nines with clue tech and they tell us, don't worry, you don't have to get any clues. And we're like, cool, that means I can just bring more weapons. The weapon or the, the enemy manager deck just goes, nah, I'm not bringing any clue tech. And that's totally fine. And that's intentional. So the only thing we worry about with that deck is the enemies. For the event deck, let's start by talking about the linchpin of the deck. Chuck Fergus. This is a 5 XP rogue ally from the Winifred Havamok deck that costs 3 to play and has an incredibly powerful ability. Whenever we play a trick or tactic event, we can exhaust Chuck to choose 2. Either discount the event by 2, make it fast, or 
get a plus two skill boost to any, to any skill test performed during the resolution of that event. Chuck is a fantastically powerful asset, and the fact that Kaimani gets five XP at the start of the campaign means it seems very likely that we'll be able to get two Chucks very early on, maybe as early as the second scenario, and we can really build our deck around always having Chuck. If we're trying to get clues while using this Chuck Fergus, then we should be using uh, tricks and tactics to get our clues. Fortunately, we have plenty. Pilfer is prohibitively expensive for most investigators, but when you're discounting it with Chuck, it only costs two, and it becomes a massive source of clues. Three clues for a single action is fantastic. And with the upgrade, and you don't even have to spend an action if you're willing to give the event fast as well, which means you're losing out on that plus two skill test, but you know, maybe you're already testing high enough with that agility. And if we have level three pilfer, we can even recur the pilfer if we succeed by two or more, which means that we can keep doing this turn after turn and getting a ton of clues. We can also use a breaking and entering, which only gives us a single clue, but if we succeed, we also automatically evade an enemy at our location, which potentially sets us up to discard an enemy with Kaimani's ability with the very next action. This is a fantastic card. There's also a couple of ones that are a little bit harder to use. Eavesdrop and Fallout both use intellect instead of agility, which makes it a little bit trickier, but Eavesdrop uses the evade value of the enemy rather than uh, the shroud location, so you can use it to bypass very high shroud locations. And Fallout gives you a bonus to your intellect if you can damage the enemy, which we might be able to do with some of our other tricks. Finally, Intel Report is neither a trick nor a tactic, but if we're discounting our events with Chuck Fergus, we might have some extra resource lying around, and it is a fantastic way to get two clues very cheaply. Next up, we have the agility-based deck. Now, we have the most simple strategy when it comes to the agility based deck, which is we have five agility, let's use our five agility to do the things that we want to be doing. To get clues, we already get the grappling hook, which can let us investigate using agility instead of intellect, but the grappling hook requires a double action to use, so we're almost always going to want to get an investigate and a move, and we cannot use it to investigate twice, so we probably want some other cards to get additional clues because otherwise only one investigate per turn that we could potentially still fail even at a five is a bit slow. Enter the Thieves Kit. Thieves Kit level zero is a three cost asset in a rogue faction with an intellect icon that uses six supplies and you can spend the supply to investigate which you may use your agility instead of your intellect. If you succeed, you gain a resource, takes up a hand slot and it is item, tool and illicit traded. However, we recently got the Thieves Kit level three, which was previewed by playing board games. Uh, this level three XP version adds an intellect icon, or sorry, adds an agility icon, has the same number of supplies and only a single additional skill value, which I was actually kind of surprised by. I would expect this one to have either more supplies or a bigger skill value boost. However, if you succeed by two, you gain two resources instead of one with that investigate which is potentially nine resources off of a single card while you're getting clues. That's fantastic. That is so much economy. Imagine, you know, this is more than a hot streak worth of money while you're doing what you're already doing. This card is fantastic for Kamani and I can definitely see, see why you want to upgrade it. In fact, this is giving you so much money that you can probably lean into the kind of big money strategies without even having to include that much additional economy. And cards like Well Connected and Cunning are pretty big powerhouse if you can keep the money up. If you rather don't go big money and just want to spend it, cards like Leo the Luca will really reward you, even if, and having to run less economy to support that is great. As well as, of course, the favors. I already talked about Interreport, Counter Espionage can protect this against the nasty treachery and can even protect our teammates if we're willing to spend that extra money. There is another card that a lot of people probably associate when it comes to rogues getting clues and using your agility, and that is Lockpicks. But I actually think Lockpicks isn't that great for Kamani, and there's a pretty straightforward reasoning for it. If you compare Thief's Kit to Lockpick, Lockpicks only actually gives you two additional skill value, because both can use our agility, Lockpicks adds the intellect, but the Kamani's intellect is only two. So Lockpicks tests test as a seven by default, while Thief's Kit tests at a five, but lockpicks also requires to succeed by two, or they start breaking. Thieves Kit, meanwhile, doesn't exhaust, 
and gives us a reason re uh, resource rebate. So there's a real reason not to bring the lockpicks. If you do want to bring the lockpicks, you're almost certainly wanting to succeed by X a lot of the time in a turn. You have cards like Lucky Cigarette Case, Quick Thinking, and other such effects that you really want to have a massive skill value. So there are decks that want to run this, but maybe not our pure agility focused deck. Finally, there are a lot of ways in Rogue to get just more agility. Uh, the Moon 18 is a fantastic card that I've already put in multiple Kamani decks because you can just start the game with 6 agility if it's in your opening hand. And I can definitely see myself playing the new Moxie from Edge of the Earth or additional manual dexterities and other skill cards that get lots of agility icons. Because again, it's just great to be able to do as much as possible with your high agility and just get that agility as high as possible. So that's our agility build. Next up is our intellect build, which is maybe a bit of an unusual choice. I mean, Kamani only has two intellect, so why would we want to have a build that relies on that? I mean, it's not like there's any investigators who are fantastic at getting clues with only two intellect, are there? Okay, there are, but Kamani doesn't have Stella's survivor access, so we're not just failing. We're not just trying to get a low intellect. So why would we want to rely on a low intellect investigator to do things with our intellect well the short answer is that there's a lot of rogue cards that do care about our intellect and they're really powerful and there's some new ones coming in this expansion including damage testimony and the fact is that kamani gets tool access but a lot of the tools care more about intellect than they do about agility so there are ways to get that intellect up I'm also thinking of the old classic Streetwise, which is a fantastic row card and can really boost intellect. So there's ways around having a base low intellect and there are some cards that will reward us. I'm building this deck more as a thought exercise than I think maybe the first place you would go, but with cards like Demon Testimony in the expansion, I don't think it's that far out. And even if it turns out that this intellect build doesn't really work in Kamani that well, there's plenty of other rogues like Finn, Trish, or even Winifred who have reasonable intellect and might be able to use it. So if you're looking at this deck and going, that seems fun, but I'm not sure I want to run it in Kamani, try it as somebody else. So the first card that I really want to put a focus on is Damning Testimony. This was a customizable card previews by Drawn to the Flame, and it has a high amount of flexibility in getting clues if there are enemies around. Because Kamani is so evasion focused, we are more likely to just leave a couple of enemies around the map, at which point we can use Deming Testimony to get clues there. Very important is this blackmail option. You get plus two intellect while investigating using Deming Testimony. And this applies even if we're not spending evidence, because keep in mind that the Deming Testimony only spends evidence after you've already succeeded in order to get an additional clue, so we're never wasting our evidence. And just taking our intellect from two to four means that we are now one good boost, whether it is a magnifying glass, a streetwise boost, or just something like a perception, to get us over the hump and start investigating even higher shroud locations with just this one asset. And looking at this list of upgrades, there's a lot of powerful things we can do with Downing Testimony once we've got some uh, intellect boosts. And most likely those intellect boosts are going to come in the form of an ally, both Nola Santiago and Janae Beauregard are 3 XP rogue allies that give both an intellect and an agility boost. And the static boosts from these explorers doesn't just help us get clues, they also both have abilities that let us uh, help us get clues. And the intellect boost also helps us trigger our reaction ability, which helps us discard enemies. You might even want to get both of them, though you're also going to have to spring for charisma, and at that point, it's pretty expensive. We'll have to see if that's manageable with Kamani's economy. So that's how we get clues with these decks. Next up, enemies. If we're jumping over to the, or we're staying with the intellect build, there's not that many tricks we specifically want to focus on. Janae obviously is still very good here. We can use her to push enemies around, which means that we might not have to deal with enemies, or we can pull an enemy from a different location to us so that can help us with uh, evasion and evading twice. Now, that evasion twice is very good, but it's pretty action intensive. However, we can cheat on that using the stealth card. The way that works is stealth normally is supposed to evade an enemy and then you disengage it, but it doesn't exhaust you. So it only kind of pseudo evades them. However, if we do our first evade normally and then use stealth for the second evade, we basically get a bonus evade with stealth, which then lets us discard the enemy, no problem. Also, before I forget to mention it, 
with Jhene, pushing enemies around, of course, can help us set up our Deming Testimony. So the, the deck really does have some strategy there going into it. We have cards that really synergize with one another. Agent Fletcher might be a problem if this is our strategy. Obviously, uh, reducing our intellect value to zero while evading them means that we can't really rely on our reaction to get rid of them. But there are a couple of ways around that. If we have sprung for a streetwise, which is expensive, especially if you're playing with the boo, where it costs six experience to include, then we can just boost our agility, and that shouldn't be a problem. But one other card, uh, which I actually got shouted out on Reddit, which I think is a fantastic include in most Kaimani decks, is Daring Maneuver level two. This 2xp, zero cost rogue event, you can play is fast and you can play it when you would succeed at a skill test. You get plus three value for this test and draw a card. So it's kind of like it only helps you over succeed, but because Agent Fletcher only has three HP, as long as we can manage to succeed at two evasions in a row, which isn't that hard, we can get rid of Agent Fletcher guaranteed on that second evade because it doesn't matter how much we succeed by, we play the daring maneuver, now we've succeeded by three and Agent Fletcher is gone. Next up, we have Agility. Agility obviously is just going to rely mostly on Evasion to getting rid of our enemies, but we want to benefit from that more, so why not run some pickpocketings? If we're going to be evading multiple times most turns, or at least, you know, that's our way of dealing with enemies, pickpocketing is going to rebate us a lot of money. Meanwhile, the Pocket Multi-Tool is another uh, new card uh, that is also customizable, and we can upgrade that one to give us plus two during evasion attempts. We have to get the signal mirror upgrade. And there's a bunch of other things we can do with this card. So this seems like a fun include to have, maybe if you're not doing much with two-handed cards, to just slide one of these in there and have a little bit of extra utility whenever you need it for a big evade. Next, we also have Quick Getaway. This is a preview card that got previewed, I think at the time of recording two days ago. Uh, got previewed by the Mythos Busters, and it's kind of this combination between dodge and a bonus action. So it's a zero XP, two cost event with double agility icons. It's a trick, and it's fast. Play when an enemy attacks you. Evade. Attempt to evade the attacking enemy. If you succeed, cancel that enemy's attack. It's out of sight, but never out of mind. So this is a very good way to trigger pickpocketing or otherwise just get rid of a nasty enemy. The double agility icons are pretty nice if you don't need that additional action to evade. And it's kind of nice to do if you're trying to get rid of an enemy that might do an attack of opportunity. You provoke the attack of opportunity intentionally and then use this to evade them and then you don't have to worry about them anymore. Be careful with alert enemies. Uh, there's a chance that you can get hurt really bad because you get att you attack an enemy, or sorry, rather, you let an enemy attack you, you try to dodge it, and if you then fail that attack, or you fail the evade, sorry, uh, the alert enemy is going to attack you twice, which can stack up real quickly. So just be a little careful, right? The out of fill comes for us all eventually. So yeah, that's the agility deck. Next up, Chuck. Our event-based suite has lots of options to dealing with enemies, but the most prominent ones are these level zero uh, events that then upgrade into either level two or level three events, namely Cheap Shot, Backstab, and Slip Away. These all... Uh, sorry, so Cheap Shot and Slip Away both let you add one stat to the other. Specifically, Cheap Shot lets you fight and add your agility. If you succeed by two or more, you automatically evade the enemy. And then the upgraded one, you only have to succeed by one, but if you succeed by three or more, you can return the Cheap Shot to your hand at the end of your turn. Backstab is just three cost. You attack using your agility instead of your combat, and the attack deals three damage. And then it also has this return to hand clause if you succeed by two or more. And finally, slip away lets you add your intellect to your evasion. And if you succeed and the enemy is not elite, you can keep them exhausted for an extra turn. All of these offers plenty of ways to dealing with enemies and with Chuck. Chuck, you can discount them, you can make them fast, or you can give yourself the stop boost, whatever you need at the moment. But you have a wide range of options for dealing with enemies through events. And then we have the enemy management suite of things. And honestly, the sky's the limit here. We can do basically whatever. We just need to have a way of boosting our stat high enough. Now keep in mind, Kamani only has a combat of two. And even though most weapons get some kind of building combat boost, we probably want something like a hard knocks or some other way of boosting our combat score. Because otherwise we might be coming up a bit short. That being said, 40, uh, sorry, the 25 automatic level two gives us automatic fights whenever we are evading enemies which seems very good if you just want to chip in there and also make your succeed by test a little easier. The Sleight of Hand Lupara is a classic rogue combo that really can put a lot of damage out very quickly. And 
I think it's great with uh, Kamani if you have to deal with an enemy that you can't deal with your reaction ability. There's also other weapons. If you don't feel like using combat, why not grab the Ornate Bow? This weapon only uses one ammo at a time, but you can use the Haste card to speed up your reloads. And it does plus two damage and uses agility with another plus two. So you're attacking at seven using no other cards. It taking up two hand slots is a big ask, but yeah, you can make that work. We have already seen that events can pick up a lot of slack for whatever else you want to be doing. And if you don't trust your combat, if you're only testing at a 2, but you like to test at a 7 sometimes, the Sledgehammer level 4 is a tool, so Kamani can take it. It's honestly just a bit of a meme, but I also would love to see it, especially to deal with Agent Fletcher, because that's one way to get rid of a government agent that's investigating you, is to just bring 25 pounds of steel vengeance to their face. And speaking of memes, the Sawed-Off Shotgun is a honestly just one fantastic big meme, but it actually does just straight up work. Like the idea that it's, it is a meme, but it also works because in Rogue, we have so many ways of making one big skill test land. I talked about calculated risk earlier, uh, I think in the last video, where it gives you an additional wild icon for every action you've performed this turn. It doesn't really matter that Sada Shotgun doesn't have a big combat boost if we have some other way of getting us a bunch of wild icons, like say having a whole bunch of actions. Meanwhile, Justify the Means is going to guarantee that we are automatically successful, as long as we're willing to pay the price in a different way. So yeah, there are a bunch of ways to deal with enemies, and I really am excited to see what roads people take for this uh, investigator, because I think that in addition to their reaction ability, there are a bunch of other things you can do with them. Now finally, there are a bunch of other cards that I just wanted to mention that didn't really fit into the first two categories. Mostly these are about dealing with uh, treacheries, which are of course important and are part of the game, but there's some other stuff in there as well. First up, let's just talk about the big money archetype. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about Well-Connected and Dario. So I put Dario in my first Kamani deck kind of as a joke originally, or maybe joke is a bit too harsh, but like, eh, whatever, I haven't played with Dario in ages, let's just see what he can do. And then it turned out that having four willpower on a rogue is actually really good and made most willpower tests very easy to pass, especially since I was also running Guts. So yeah, I'm not saying, you know, every Kamani deck should be a Dario deck, but maybe think about him at level zero. He's better than you think. And of course, if you have lots of money, Well Connected is also going to perform well. I talked about this with the Thieves Kit. You're going to have a lot of money and this is gonna let you pass whatever tests you need to pass, no problem. There's also the tool belt. This was also previewed by Drawn to the Flame. And this is a body slot of asset that lets you attach your tools to it, at which point they no longer take up slots. But they also are blanked while they stay attached to the tool belt. There are a lot of things you can do with this. I think obviously most tools you want to have them in play for them to do anything, but there are a couple of tools that you could maybe store away for a rainy day. I'm specifically thinking of the fire extinguisher level three, which has a very powerful mass evasion option that requires you to discard it. So just having played it and then attached it to the tool belt lets you save that away for whenever you need it and the situation gets dire. And if the situation is getting dire, well, you know, nothing like a chainsaw to change things up a bit. This weapon doesn't have the biggest combat boost and it takes up two hand slots, so you're probably gonna need to use the tool belt to store it until you need it. But it also gives you a benefit if you fail, either dealing a bit of damage anyway, or giving you the ammo or supply back. So I think this is a card that you could honestly consider. I think it's still a bit of a meme, but it's at least a funny one. And it's not even the worst. I also want to talk about a bunch of the exceptional cards. Uh, the ones that I most called out to were the two that boost all of your stats, which are Guess, Gesh and the Black Fan. Both of these have the ability to boost every one of your stats, which is particularly noteworthy for Kaimani because you're most likely combining their agility and their intellect a lot of the time for their reaction ability. And you also care about your willpower to pass tasks, and you might even care about combat. Both of these have other effects as well. Well, <laughs> Gash can potentially give you a lot of curses, which I don't know if you want that or not, but it's also slotless. The Black Fan is not slotless and requires you to have a lot of money, but it also gives you additional health and sanity and multiple extra actions every, or an extra action every turn. The Red Clock does not boost all of your stats, but it does boost the first test you're taking every round. So if you are trying to do a big 
Deming testimony investigate, if you can set it up so that you can get your red clock test uh, boost on that test, then it's going to take care of your intellect troubles that way. And it also works with combat. So I think, you know, you could consider this. It's an expensive card, as all exceptional cards always are, but I think it's worth the investment. For the Chuck Fergus event-based deck, I really want to shout out the Crystallizer of Dream. So for most of my Kamani decks so far, I found a lot of success with the Luggy Cigarette Case. But for the event-based deck, I really think you want the Crystallizer because it lets you use your events as skill cards after you've used them as their event site. And it's worth saying that the Guardian of the Crystallizer enters play exhausted. So if you get a chance to use Kamani's reaction ability before they ready up, you only have to evade them once to get rid of them. And the card Easy Mark, I think is easy to forget about because it's just, you know, one of those myriad cards that was printed in Dream Eaters, but it's actually really good for making your deck more consistent. And if you're playing with the Crystallizer, it's also going to give you a bunch of extra skill icons, either Intellect or Agility, which is great. I really recommend you play these in as many Kamani decks, probably spending your starting 5 XP on that. Which, speaking of the starting 5 XP, there's one card that I really should be talking about now, which is Charon's Obol. So this permanent exceptional card gives you two additional XP if you're not defeating their scenario, but if you are defeated, you are killed. I think in most groups I play with, it's pretty standard that the rogue takes Charon's Obol because it's such a powerful card if you can avoid dying, and there are a bunch of ways in rogue to avoid dying, such as you handle this one to throw an encounter card at somebody else, or even I'm out of here to just resign on the spot. Charon's Obol is better if you can take it as early in the campaign as possible. And a lot of people have been playing with In the Thick of It, the neutral permanent from Edge of the Earth, which gives you three to, two trauma for three XP at the start of the campaign. Because getting Karen's Obo for one additional scenario before scenario one instead of after makes it earn you two additional experience over the course of the campaign. Kamani Jones doesn't even have to take uh, In the Thick of It to be able to do this, getting the Karen's Obo with the first five XP, which means you only have three XP to spend before the first scenario but getting an additional two after the first more than makes up for that. So yeah, these are the four decks that I thought wanted to talk about that I think are archetypes, broadly speaking, that you can really do something with Kamani. And I think it's important to think about what your Kamani deck is doing because it's, I think, an easy trap to fall into to just grab whatever best cards are and try to jam them on the single deck. Because I really do think that you want to have your deck kind of flowing alongside, along a certain line, right? You want one stat that you really care about, or maybe two stats if you're doing like the intellect plus agility thing, but then you're doing things like Lola Santiago and Janae Beauregard, right? You want your cards to all work together and have this kind of internal consistency and this synergy. There are also a couple of decks that I want to give examples for that I think just don't really work. And those are a cares about lots of taking lots of actions deck, a scavenging deck and a synergy deck. So the additional action deck, really, I think I've already talked about calculated risk, but the real payoff here has been in the past payday. Now payday gives you an extra resource, gives you a resource for every action you perform this turn, and then it ends your turn. This is usually played in Finn or Tony, and then you use Fence to play the payday fast after you take your last action, so it becomes a fast gain a bunch of money. And then you usually use a card like Borrowed Time and Leo the Luca and Haste and all the other stuff to give you a lot more actions. And this is fine and actually, honestly, is pretty good in Finn and it's reasonable in Tony, but there's a reason why I think it's better in them than in Kamani. And there's actually multiple reasons. So the first is your bonus action only comes in the form of your grappling hook, not in the form of any card kind of thing on your investigator card. So odds are you're gonna have at least one scenario in a campaign where your grappling hook is at the bottom of your deck and you drop both your paydays early and you just can't play them until after you found all your extra action tech, at which point do you even need the economy anymore? Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I don't know if Kaimani wants fence. I don't think so. Obviously the thieves kits are illicit and there's probably some other illicit cards, but there's not that many. And I don't see Kaimani Jones running a lot of guns, which is the main thing that I think Finn and uh, Tony are, reason, are using fence for, as well as lockpicks, which again, I already mentioned, I don't think Kamani Jones is a lockpicks user. At which point adding these cards into your deck feels like it's adding a bunch of stuff to make an economy card work that you can just do better anyway as a rogue, right? Like you don't need lots of good economy in rogue because you already get that. Now there comes with a big caveat. 
this is this video is being recorded on August 10th. We don't have most of the XP cards for the set yet. If we get a big cares about extra actions payoff card in the high XP slots, maybe something like payday, but you draw a card instead of gaining a resource, then obviously this all goes out the window, right? If there's a big enough pay payoff card that makes this work, then yeah, go for it, right? Grab this deck archetype, play it. Because Kamani does get multiple additional actions thanks to that grappling hook. But as it sits right now, I would skip this one and maybe wait until we get a little bit more payoff or a couple more additional action cards that really work for Kamani. Next, we have the scavenging archetype. And the problem almost immediately becomes apparent. Kamani can't take scavenging. At least not without using a card like Versatile or a card like You Owe Me One to get it from another investigator. And this immediately introduces a whole bunch of variants and makes the decks way less consistent. Now, why would you want scavenging in the first place? Well, the answer is probably the most important tool that came out of Edge of the Earth was Ice Pick Level 3. And this turns into a repeatable deduction or repeatable vicious blow. It doesn't help you on evasion, which is another strike against the Ice Pick, honestly. But more importantly, this card is only, in my opinion, worth the 3 XP if you can use it multiple times. And in order to do that, you're going to need to have a scavenging style recursion card. You could do this in Kamani, but in order to do that, again, we have to add Versatile, we have to add You Owe Me One, you have to do all kinds of shenanigans, then you have to start investigating by two or more because you need to get the card back. And you also don't get the other scavenging payoff cards like Schofner's Catalog or Short Supply. I think it's possible to do something with scavenging Kamani, but at this point it feels like you're really forcing an archetype in there that doesn't want to go in there and doesn't have the support as of yet. So again, if other cards get previewed that maybe interact with Ice Pick, maybe, but as it sits right now, no thanks. And then finally, Synergy. Now this one is not because it's necessarily bad, but I think it's maybe a bit of a trap to invest too heavily in Synergy. So. In order to really use Synergy, you're going to need to include one of the triple class talents, probably Antiquary, because you don't get Mystic coverage a lot of other ways. And then you have to get Riot Whistle, which is a Guardian tool, and a Survivor tool in order to get all five classes covered. At that point, you can do Cheat the System for five resources, and you get Call for Backup for all five modes. But the thing is, I don't think that's worth it. I mean, Call for Backup is nice, but it's ultimately just a move, a clue, a damage, and a little bit of healing. And Cheat the System is economy, which I already mentioned, there's lots of great economy options in Rogue. Just play Faustian Bargain, just play Lone Wolf, right? Just play these other economy cards. And if you wanna run one of the three uh, triple class talents in uh, from Edge of the Earth, just play Crafty. Crafty covers Trick and uh, Tool, which are two massive traits for Kamani. And instead of having this antiquary, which is only really there to give you the mystic access and then maybe on a couple of the favors, you just have this talent that you can use every turn with most of the cards in your deck. And that just seems way better. So yeah, I don't want to go, I don't want to say that you should never go Synergy Kamani, but as it sits right now, I don't think it's an easy way to get all five class coverage. And if you want to do the things that Synergy are doing for you, you have better cards that don't require Synergy in order to do that. And you also don't get the best synergy payoffs because you don't get close to circle and you don't get the gang up, which is the guardian one. So yeah, you're just really not getting most of the benefits. Wow, what a video. I'm, I'm hoping you can tell that I'm super excited for this new investigator and I'm really curious to hear what you do. If you've got any deck lists, please post them in the comments below. If you've made it this far, I'm just going to have to ask for if you can like the video, subscribe if you haven't, because I've put a lot of thought into this video. This video is literally like three days of me writing and researching and putting all kinds of cards together and talking to people and trying to figure out what I should talk about and what I should prioritize. I hope it's been worth the effort. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be seeing you until the end of time.